Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Press and Hill briefing on disaster housing recovery for vulnerable populations. I'm Sarah Michelson, the Senior Director of Public Policy at the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Um, this briefing is being hosted by the Disaster Housing Recovery Coalition, and it's open to press, Hill staff, and other advocates. Uh, the Disaster Housing Recovery Coalition is composed of nearly 800 local, state, and national organizations focused on ensuring that federal disaster recovery efforts serve all households, including those with the lowest incomes. Low-income survivors we know from past experience are often the hardest hit by disasters and have the fewest resources to recover. And without sustained advocacy, we know that they're often left behind in the recovery process. On today's briefing, we'll hear from advocates working directly in disaster-impacted communities about the most pressing housing challenges facing survivors, including those impacted by the ongoing wildfires in California, those still reeling from the hurricanes in Florida and the Carolinas, Hurricanes Michael and Florence, as well as the continued ongoing issues uh, stemming from Hurricane Harvey in Texas and Hurricane Maria more than a year ago. Um, what these advocates will describe, um, the failure of the federal government to address uh, the housing needs of survivors, uh, the enormous obstacles to receiving assistance, the racial disparities in disaster recovery, and the lack of community input are all issues that we've seen play out time and time again. The hard-fought lessons learned from Hurricane Katrina and other storms continues to reoccur after every major disaster, and both Congress and FEMA have not done enough to address these major failings. Um, as we hear from local advocates, uh, after we hear from local advocates, we'll then hear from experts who have been working on disaster recovery issues at the national level, who will discuss what Congress and the administration can do now to start to improve the federal recovery system. I think we're at a moment now where there's more recognition than, uh, than in the past that our current federal disaster response was never really designed with low-income people in mind and that uh, changes are needed, uh, but we really need Congress to act to hold FEMA accountable through hearings and through legislative change to make this process work for all survivors. Um, at this point, we'll turn over to our speakers who will talk about some of the local perspectives on disaster recovery issues. And we'll start with Eileen Jacobs from the California Rural Legal Assistance. Um, organization. Eileen, I'll turn it over to you and just to remind you to unmute your line. Thank you. I have unmuted it. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you're great. All right. Thank you and uh, good morning. It's quite early morning on Pacific time. I will start in my few minutes of, of remarks uh, by extending sympathy to the victims of the ongoing wildfires, Woolsey Hill in Southern California, and especially the campfire in Northern California. I am physically near uh, that fire, thankfully not near enough to be in it, but much of Northern California right now is covered as we are in smoke and ash, and we are in the midst of crisis and immediate response. But I also have had the, the sad news that there have been more remains discovered and likely to be more from the campfire in Northern California. I want to recognize that because I couldn't address this group without saying it. I would like to speak a little bit about both immediate and long-term needs because we are still facing recovery issues from the 2017 and mid-2018 wildfires and mudslides, again in Northern and Southern California. Some of those immediate needs and many of those long-term needs have not yet been resolved. And in part, that is a problem of systemic proportions with the emergency response and disaster recovery response that doesn't address in many respects low-income families and individuals, concentrated areas of poverty and race, farm worker communities, the homeless, 
people who live in mobile home parks, people who are language minorities, limited English proficient, and other special and vulnerable populations like people with disabilities. The emergency delivery system for disaster assistance really is not set up with those people in mind. The disaster response is set up for people who can have access more readily on their own and who can go to a disaster center, who can get online somehow, who have additional resources on which they can lean, whether it's family members or savings. And the requirements for emergency assistance or for temporary shelter often favor people who are more able and who have more resources to begin with, rather than being focused on the homeless, on migrant and seasonal farm workers, on low-income people who live in mobile home parks. And in a long-term sense, recovery is not focused on preventing the displacement of entire communities. It is not focused on meeting the needs of low-income, low income, lo communities, low-wage workers who have lost their jobs and who are being displaced from communities that, to begin with, do not have decent, affordable housing to meet the needs of low-income people, of people with disabilities, and many communities that already are concentrated areas of poverty and race are being permanently displaced without any attention to disaster recovery and special needs in those communities. Infrastructure needs are not addressed. Mobile home parks that have been entirely wiped out are not replaced. There are bureaucratic impediments for addressing infrastructure needs, for addressing long-term decent affordable housing needs. So I want to call attention to the fact that housing funds, community development funds, infrastructure funds, and attention to those needs must be paid in order to properly address long-term recovery needs, or we are going to, as I'm afraid we have in the past, continue to repeat ourselves with the problems of one disaster to the next. If there are questions at some point, I would be glad to respond to them. And I want to emphasize one other issue. Um, well, two other issues. One is, and tell me if I'm going over my time, Sarah. One is that for California, it is a misnomer and it is misleading to call these wine country and Malibu fires. That makes people think that it's movie stars and vintners who have been affected. That is not the case. There are entire communities of low-income people, low-wage workers, farm workers, and people who live in poverty and will be permanently displaced unless we address the long-term issues, unless we address the needs of the homeless. Some of the homeless in the Northern California wildfires were told by FEMA you were homeless before the fires, so we can't provide any assistance to you. Low-income people were told, we can't discriminate on the basis of income, so we're not going to provide any special assistance to you because you're low income. Those are practices and policies that must be reversed, and long-term needs and long-term displacement need attention, and immediately housing, trailers need to be brought in to provide housing for people. Making referrals to Airbnb is not going to satisfy the temporary or the long-term needs for affordable housing in the communities that have been affected by these wildfires. Thank you so much, Eileen. We really appreciate you joining on the line. I know that when we talked a couple days ago, you were even wearing a mask over your face to prevent yourself from breathing in the smoke, and we so appreciate you joining today. I do want to turn over to our next speaker, Leslie Powell-Boudreau.
um, who will be uh, joining us from Legal Services of North Florida. Make sure your slide gets over. Um, just a reminder to everybody that Hurricane Michael hit uh, the panhandle um, many, many weeks ago, and we haven't heard from FEMA, or we have heard from FEMA that temporary assistance will just now be starting to get to um, those communities next week, which is nearly six weeks after the storm. So, Leslie, I'll turn that over to you now. Thank you, um, and thanks everyone for joining this morning. I'm, I'm glad for this opportunity to share information and an overview with you of, of what we're seeing on the ground um, in the uh, 12 affected counties, 11 of which are within uh, Legal Services of North Florida's uh, traditional service area. Um, and I'm going to pick up a little bit where Eileen left off, which is um, the, the challenges facing low income individuals who simply have no place to go and no, uh, nowhere to, to relocate to within the communities that they know and in which their children live. Uh, we recently had a call that included the mayor of Panama City who expressed um, a very heartfelt fear for the flight of and blight of the communities uh, that they live in. Uh, in particular, he was talking about the school systems, but just by way of anecdote, I recently saw on social media a plea for people to apply at the local Piggly Wiggly because they didn't have enough low wage workers to staff the local grocery store that was able to reopen. And that's that's just a, a, that's an example of the fear that those um, service industry and low wage jobs won't have workers because those workers will have no place to live. As um, was suggested, the um, we have heard that the direct housing assistance in the form of um, RVs and mobile homes is in route anticipated to arrive in the affected communities on November the 18th. That is six weeks following the landfall on October 10th. Um, what we have seen and what has led people to leave is that landlords have essentially attempted to unlawfully evict individuals, often from fully habitable units using an any means necessary ideology. They're not connecting power, even though it could be connected to the buildings. They're not connecting water, even though it could be available. They're removing mailboxes or putting uh, notes in the post in for postal delivery workers saying that those uh, that that person no longer lives there. We recently had an incident at, a, at an apartment complex where they actually worked to change the locks to access the mailboxes. And we had to reach out to the local postmaster to have them remedy the situation. Um, they've removed belongings while residents go to distribution sites and, and disaster recovery sites. Um, and, 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 and in some incidents, incidences, there have been reports that they have actually moved other tenants in. Um, they, uh, many of these individuals are, are disabled. They, um, there are, there are veterans. This is a, a, a very strong military community throughout these 11 counties. Um, the lack of power and the lack of resources has harmed those, those disabled individuals more because as they've not had power and not had access to oxygen and had to have the windows open, um, there's a lot of smoke, there's a lot of debris, there's a lot of things that might come through and has, has, has exacerbated other health conditions. Many of these families are being denied FEMA assistance as their housing is determined to be habitable even though their landlords are trying to throw them out. Um, and many of these units are federally subsidized with landlords failing to follow federal law on the steps that, must, that they must take in the wake of a disaster. Um, and which brings me back to what is really the lack of alternative housing at all in these communities. Those who rented um, don't have very many places to go. The housing stock has been taken by those who um, had some ability to afford it within those communities. Um, we've been told that many of them have moved to tents in the woods. They've been offered transportation out of state to places like New Orleans, but th these are not people who wanna leave where they are, so they've, they've made other choices. Um, they, um, have again the, the the loss of the worker population is is significant, um, but one one unique characteristic about the low wage um, individuals and low income individuals in some of these communities, these rural communities, is that they are homeowners. They often don't rent. 
And if they had damage to their home, if they had damage to, to a mobile home or a sticks and, and mortar home, they don't have the ability to rebuild and, and may choose to simply live in substandard housing conditions, which will just continue uh, the, the, the poverty of their families um, in, in terms of health and well being. Um, and then finally, the last issue is many, there, there is a, a fairly significant amount of domestic, viol domestic violence in many of these communities. And many of those victims are left with uh, relocation orders that make relocation a challenge, and then they have no place to go. So um, uh, just to wrap back around, it is that fear of simply uh, flight and blight from these communities with no place to go, and we are hopeful that the mobile homes with direct housing coming into the community will help to remedy that. As of yet, we don't have any um, answers from FEMA about where those mobile homes are going to be located, whether they will be made available to renters versus homeowners, and what resources are gonna be made available to them. Uh, that we had a call as recently as, as Monday in which we, we received no answers to those questions. So uh, along with Eileen, I'm, I'm on for the rest of the call if there are questions as we get to that point. Thank you, Leslie. We'll take calls at the end uh, after we get through the presentations, but I really appreciate you um, uh, bringing up these points. It's, from our perspective, it's just unacceptable that FEMA's waited this long or that this much time has passed on before uh, people are getting temporary housing. I'm going to move over to our next speaker, uh, Leslie Albritton from Legal Aid of North uh, Carolina, who can speak about uh, the impact two months out from Hurricane Florence uh, making landfall. Leslie, are you there? I am. Thank you so much for having me on this morning and giving me an opportunity to shine a light about what we are seeing on the ground here in North Carolina. My focus will be on Florence. However, I did want to point out that we still have clients with housing needs from Matthew from over two years ago. In North Carolina, the areas that were impacted by Florence are very rural and coastal communities. And I just want to mention that there's, our clients struggle with affordable housing concerns and lack of reliable public transportation concerns in those areas, even without um, issues surrounding natural disasters. The biggest issue that we are grappling with still post-Florence are much like in Florida, low income renters who have been displaced from subsidized housing, mainly project-based section eight properties and low income taxpayer credit properties. These tenants are being told to vacate the, their apartments because they are uninhabitable, often receiving very short, around 72 hours notice to do so as in Florida, it seems to be the landlords or property management companies that are making the determination that these complexes, entire complexes, are uninhabitable, where in actual fact, it may be only certain units that are uninhabitable, or there may be multiple units that require minimal repairs. In most of these cases, no government agency like HUD or a health department has determined that the complexes are uninhabitable. And in fact, FEMA has denied assistance to some of these low-income renters because they deem the units to be habitable. And as with Florida, we're finding that there are landlords who are stopping mail delivery to the apartment complexes, telling school buses not to come to the complexes anymore, or providing dumpsters to the tenants and telling them to either get their belongings out or throw them out in the dumpsters as they move out. Just in the complexes where we have clients, there, they represent over 600 units of affordable housing in North Carolina. So I feel that it's probably a safe estimate that around 1,000 low income people are impacted. And these are just in the complexes where we have clients. We've heard about anecdotally about other low income complexes where the same things are happening. 
some people have received FEMA money, but because of the large number of displaced persons at this time, our clients are, have, are finding that they have no place to use their FEMA money in their local communities. And many of these are families with school-aged children, so they don't want to leave their local communities and change school district because their kids have already been uprooted to hotels or to friends' homes. They don't want to change school districts and further destabilize their families. Many of our clients have jobs close by to their original housing and they lack reliable transportation. And as I pointed out earlier, there's not reliable public transportation and our clients just don't have the means to commute to their jobs from other counties. Um, compounding their stress, they're either being given no time frame in which their units will be repaired or upwards of six months and more for repairs to be made. So when they're relying solely on temporary housing assistance funds from FEMA and they're in hotels, they constantly face stress that they don't know when their funds will run out and that they may risk their, they may be at risk of homelessness because they can't afford to pay for a market rate unit when they run out of assistance or to pay for the hotels in which they're staying temporarily while, they're, while they wait for their units to be fixed. And again, I will be on the call as well for questions afterwards. I just thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Leslie. Appreciate that. Uh, we're going to move over to our next speaker, who's also from North Carolina, Samuel Hunter, who's the North Carolina Housing Coalition, uh, to also talk about the long term uh, challenges there. Samuel? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so following up on, on what Leslie said, I think one of the challenges that we have found in North Carolina um, is, a, is a communication challenge. Uh, I think there's a lot of folks out there who uh, should be eligible for assistance but don't know that. Um, that, that is a, a constant challenge. And part of, part of that is connected to, you know, like Leslie also mentioned that we're still recovering from Hurricane Matthew two years ago. Uh, some of the first CDBG disaster recovery money went out the door two years after the storm two months ago. Uh, and that is a capacity challenge for the state of North Carolina. A number of years ago, when Hurricane Floyd hit in the late 90s, in 1999, we had a statewide network of state-supported community development organizations that were locally embedded and connected to a state infrastructure that knew how to do long-term community development. And I think as we all understand, and either are beginning to understand or have known for a long time, that disaster recovery is in many ways indistinguishable several months out from long-term community development, right? And so the challenges that we see in these communities are connected to the challenges we see even when there's not a, uh, a disaster. And so a number of years ago in the state of North Carolina, at the state level, we gutted that statewide infrastructure and moved all of our CDBG, CDBG dollars away from housing toward water infrastructure. And so when Matthew hits two years ago, we don't have the expertise at the state level and we don't have the organizations at the local level that know how to get this money out quickly and are connected to the communities that need this assistance the most. And so you spend two years standing up a program and you've got this massive pipeline that is now further complicated by uh, the impact of Florence and the impact of Michael. Uh, and so that's one of the major challenges that we're seeing as we set ourselves up for the long-term recovery, to continue the long-term recovery from Matthew two years ago and begin the long-term recovery from Florence and Michael. Uh, and as other people have said, you know, we know that these storms, while they are indiscriminate, they end up hitting communities that are at higher risk, which tend to be low-income communities, communities of color. Uh, and that is absolutely a challenge that we are seeing um, in the state of North Carolina. While the, we know this from Matthew, the, the recovery centers that were set up, even though we have 30 plus disaster care counties in North Carolina from the most recent storms, we only have, I think, 18 uh, centers set up. Folks tend to not go to those centers, which we know from Michael, right? Um, part of the challenge is outreach. And while there has not been good government response, uh, some philanthropy has had to fill in the gap. Um, uh, to help uh, do outreach to communities that may not know about services that they are eligible for. Uh, 
Um, and we're, while we are appreciative of that, uh, you know, the, both the state and the, the federal government need to be doing a better job on that on that front. Um, I'll also be around for questions. Thank you, Samuel, for for pointing to those systemic challenges at the local level. I think that's some piece that doesn't get picked up enough is this um, new emphasis among the administration to shift more and more disaster recovery um, responsibility to the state level, whether or not they really have the capacity or the ability to do that. I'll now turn to our next speaker, uh, Amelia Adams from Texas Housers. Um, uh, both Amelia and our, our next speaker We'll talk about storms that happened more than a year ago. Um, both of those speakers saw the same challenges that we are seeing uh, in California and the Carolinas and Florida. They saw that play out with their own storms as well. Uh, but I'll turn it to them to, to talk about some of the continued challenges there. Amelia, are you on the line? I am. Can you hear me? Yes. So thanks everyone. I'm going to speak really briefly about just a couple of issues of concern in Texas since Hurricane Harvey, which we know happened in August 2017. Um, and we think that these issues could, al could also be potentially important in other states and other disasters that have happened more recently. So the first is that low-income FEMA applicants were found disproportionately likely to be denied for FEMA assistance. Uh, among the highest income applicants, denial rates were 10%, as you see on the top. And for the lowest income applicants, they were 46%. So there's a huge disparity that begs the question, why are all these low-income people being denied assistance? And this is something that we've been investigating. Uh, so the next slide is great. Next slide. Oh, thank you. So when an applicant is found ineligible for FEMA, they're sent a letter with a code on it. Um, and we spent a long time looking into these codes and what they mean and, and who they tend to apply to. So you can see some examples of the codes on the left. And it turns out some of these codes are disproportionately common among the lowest income applicants. And here I've broken it down, uh, each code, by the income of the applicants who tend to receive it during Harvey. So the largest, uh, the darkest red is the lowest income applicants and the gold is the highest. Uh, the ones in gray mean they didn't report their income. And the top bar shows the overall income breakdown for all applicants for assistance. And then uh, a breakdown of in ineligible applicants is right underneath. So we can see that those ineligible applicants are much more likely to be in that red category, the low income. Um, and I've also circled two examples of ineligibility codes that are much more common in those low income applicants. Uh, one is no contact for inspection, and one is failed identity verification. And another example is uh, ownership or occupancy not verified, which we know from attorneys applies often to people who have title issues or mobile home owners or people with atypical living situations, like two families on the same lot. Um, so we've been working with advocates and attorneys and also people that we've identified who've experienced those denials to figure out what happens after to these people, whether it's they continue to live in their moldy, destroyed homes or they have to leave the area entirely or you know, how are their lives disrupted? So our hope is that by looking at this data, uh, we can inform improvements to the FEMA process and also identify people who tend to be left out of it and who could be helped in later funding streams like CDBG. So that's where we are in Texas right now. Um, next slide, please. So the, the state of Texas is committed to what it's calling a localized and decentralized recovery. And this sounds like it would allow cities to use their local expertise to craft a perfectly tailored recovery program for their area. But what it really means is that government bodies with the most resources, the most uh, expertise, the most political power tend to get the funding, while those with the fewest resources end up getting overlooked. Uh, and a good example of this is to look at Southeast Texas region, which is home to both an extensive petrochemical industry and also some very segregated cities. The cities of Beaumont and Port Arthur, which are kind of the biggest cities in that area, were by any count the most impacted cities in that region, as you can see by these uh, red dots. Next slide, please. But when it came time for the region to allocate CDBG funding for buyouts and infrastructure, they came up with this hugely unequal and racially discriminatory plan, um, which I won't go into, it's more complicated, but the chart shows that the cities with the lowest funding per person are also the cities with the highest percentage people of color. Um, and we're extremely concerned that plans like this done by local governments are going to reinforce that regional inequality 
that's already so entrenched through decades of segregation. Um, and another example of that unequal capacity of uh, local governments is shows up when we look at the applications for projects with, for example, the Texas Department of Emergency Management. So the bar for application is set higher than most poorer communities can manage, which is why we see no project proposals at all in the heavily damaged Southeast Texas area, which is home to Port Arthur and Beaumont. Uh, and if the state doesn't provide extensive assistance and outreach to those governments that have less capacity, we're concerned that they just won't have an equal chance of getting funding, and we're seeing that on the ground now. Um, so one issue is with low-income applicants being left out from the start with FEMA, and the other is with low-income areas having unequal capacity in that long-term recovery process. And overall, we think that these are problems that likely are occurring or will occur in other disasters in other states, so they're, they're worth taking a look at. And finally, before I, I finish, I should mention that at this stage, we're seeing uh, some serious deficiency with the state program for rental housing re stock recovery. About half of Harvey FEMA applicants were renters, but only 14% of those CDBG funds are being targeted at rebuilding rental units. So before Harvey, there was already a lack of affordable, affordable and available rental housing for the lowest income, people making 30% or less, 50% or less um, area median income. But the biggest problem is the state just isn't prioritizing what kinds of multifamily projects it wants to build. For example, those that have rents that match the community need or those that are in high opportunity areas with good access to schools and transit. Instead, they're just kind of accepting developer applications on a first come first served basis without preference for location or affordability level. So we know that renters are more likely to be low income and people of color. So again, we're really concerned that the recovery process is leaving out these groups. And we don't wanna see this happen in other states like Florida and North Carolina who are now in that recovery process again, for as you say, another time. So thanks so much for, uh, for letting me speak. Thank you, Amelia. We'll turn now to our next speaker from uh, uh, Puerto Rico, Adi Martinez Roman, who is from the Access to Justice Fund Foundation. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah, and to the National Low Income Housing Coalition for giving me this opportunity to voice out the status of the disaster uh, recovery in Puerto Rico and giving us voice uh, in this panel. Uh, a year ago, more than a year ago, September 2017, we were hit by the third more disastrous hurricane since 1980s in the U.S. But that was a week after we were hit by another hurricane. We were first hit by Irma, and then we were hit by Maria. Uh, I'm going to start. Next slide, uh, uh, please. Uh, uh, next slide. <laughs> uh, I'm just gonna start with some info of, of, of the results of the disaster that contextualize the issues that we're facing. Uh, the damages have been calculated from 90 billion uh, uh, FEMA estimates to 139 billion uh, estimate by the government of Puerto Rico. Uh, from uh, the sources we have, federal funds that have been authorized are 33 billion for disaster recovery funds to 45 billion if we count non-disaster related sources of federal funds that are flowing into Puerto Rico and have been authorized. Nevertheless, this morning, there was a press release about President Trump saying that he was not going to allow any more funds to be assigned to Puerto Rico, which has been very disheartening to hear here in the island, uh, making this morning very grim to many. Uh, you have to realize Puerto Rico is an island of 3.5 million people, and 50% of the population is under the poverty level. So that means that at least 1.7 million people are under the poverty level of the United States. Uh, so after the disaster, there was 1.107 million FEMA applications by April. Of those, only 462,000 were approved. And that means that more than 60% of the applications to receive help to rebuild their homes have been denied. 
So that is more than 600,000 people that did not receive any help from FEMA. From those, only 43,000 people appealed the FEMA denial. So that means that a lot of people gave up on the first try. More than half a million people gave up. Uh, and of those 43,000 appeals, 75% were denied. Uh, from the numbers we've gotten, because uh, a lot of people that we have served, uh, 78,000 denials were uh, due to ownership not verified, but we suspect it's higher because of the amount of people that have uh, come out with that problem. Uh, with the other FEMA, uh, a funded program here through the housing, Puerto Rico Housing Department uh, program, Your House Reborn, only 68,000 homes have received temporary fixes, but of those we have received a lot of claims too. Uh, to mo uh, more or less understand what has happened, uh, there's almost 60,000 blue roofs installed in Puerto Rico and FEMA provided 126,000 cars. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Yes. So now uh, we can say that uh, the issues that are still faced by, by us include the denials of FEMA, a high rate of denials, and the low amount of the awards, the CDBGDR funds, um, have been assigned, but still uh, they are being held back by the HUD, uh, uh, even the $1.5 billion, which the action plan already approved. Um, we are concerned about the ownership, not verified denials, because we have been working, working directly, directly with FEMA and with the help uh, of a lot of advocates in the United States. Uh, and we were able to get FEMA to approve a form, an alternative way to prove ownership according to Puerto Rican law and FEMA status. Uh, but even if we achieve that, FEMA is refusing to notify the people that have been denied because of ownership not verified. Also, as I mentioned, high number of your house reborn claims, uh, even there was a referral to the FBI regarding that program and the CDBGDR uh, monies, there is still concerns of low-income communities because we don't see that mitigation has been a priority. And when I say mitigation is that after the hurricane, almost all of Puerto Rico has become a floodplain because everything flooded for F in FEMA maps. So um, now low-income communities are in risk of being displaced because they are uh, declared to be in flood zones and we are asking for mitigation of channeling waters uh, to be the priority, uh, and also to make processes of relocation participatory. Uh, and uh, that, that uh, has been our main claim to the housing department in Puerto Rico. They were going to create an advisory committee to be able to uh, participate in the implementation of the plan, but we haven't seen much action yet. Next slide, please. So uh, I wanted to, next slide, Sarah. I wanted to, uh, for you to leave you with this image, uh, if we can have next slide. This is still the way you look at Puerto Rico when you come out by, by plane. There's still thousands of people living with blue roofs more than a year after a hurricane. It, and uh, uh, and people are still suffering every time it rains in Puerto Rico. Uh, old people falling and, 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 and receiving injuries and losing their stuff uh, because of the rain. So uh, I'm very uh, uh, glad that I got the chance to talk about this and I'm ready to receive any questions or comments. Thank you, Adi. I appreciate your feedback here and thank you for joining us from uh, so far away, I know it's very early where you are. Um, we want to shift now to the, some of the national perspective uh, of what Congress can be doing now to hold FEMA accountable for uh, these issues and how it can move forward with legislation that would improve that situation. I'll start by talking about some of the uh, ways that Congress can help oversee the short-term 
uh, and, and medium-term housing needs of people who have been displaced. Um, having stable uh, housing, as our other speakers have mentioned, is one of the top priorities after a disaster, but we've seen time and again that FEMA has refused to use all of the programs available and at its disposal to help people uh, find those affordable, safe homes. Um, one of the, the the programs that we have been pushing for uh, most strongly has been the Disaster Housing Assistance Program, which is designed with low-income people in mind and helps overcome many of the barriers that our speakers have spoken about um, when it comes to the TSA Hotel Program at FEMA and other temporary housing solutions. Um, DHAP has been used in the past after other disasters. It was created uh, after Hurricane Katrina. It has been upheld by past administrations, both Democratic and Republican, as being a best practice for serving the needs, unique needs of low-income people. What we've seen time and again is that without DHAP and without similar uh, assistance, uh, survivors often have no choice but to move into uninhabitable homes uh, or crowded homes, to stay at shelters, to sleep in their cars or tents. Um, uh, w because they don't have access to housing or they're paying more than half of their income on rent, doubling and tripling up with other families, all of which are precarious housing situations that put them at higher risk of evictions and in worst cases, homelessness. We saw this happen, especially in high numbers after uh, Hurricane Maria, with many people displaced to the U.S. States like Connecticut, Massachusetts, uh, Pennsylvania, and Florida saw uh, large numbers of families who were displaced enter into their state homelessness system because they weren't getting the assistance that they needed from FEMA. So one of the first things that Congress can be doing is holding hearings uh, on the, the uh, immediate housing needs of low-income people and what changes could be happening, but also to pass legislation that's been introduced by Senator Warren and Representative Espayat, as well as Senator Bill Nelson, that would provide immediate assistance and longer-term assistance to these families. I'd like to also turn it over to our next speaker, Laura Esquivel from the Hispanic Federation. Good morning, everybody. This is Laura. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Terrific. Um, so, um, as Adi mentioned uh, a bit ago, over a million people have filed claims for individual assistance from FEMA in Puerto Rico, and over 60% of those have been denied. Um, and large numbers of those have been denied because of FEMA's unwillingness to accept alternative documentation as proof of home ownership. Mind you, FEMA already has within its regulations the ability to accept alternative document documentation, and they've done so following past disasters. And in spite of efforts to work with FEMA to develop a FEMA-approved affidavit as proof of ownership, which has been done, but is still not being implemented properly by FEMA, it seems there's still a need for a legislative fix for Congress to direct FEMA to adopt procedures that require it to meet its mission of providing assistance to people impacted and in many cases devastated by disasters. And that's where the Housing Victims of Major Disasters Act uh, come in. It has been introduced in both the House and the Senate, um, and in the House, it is a bipartisan bill. This bill would require FEMA to implement its own existing policies to ensure that survivors who lack formal legal documentation of ownership can use alternative proof to get access to disaster assistance, allowing survivors of Hurricane Maria to use disaster funding to gain title to their land is critical since more than half of Puerto Rico's houses are quote unquote informal. Um, and this is a system that has worked for decades in Puerto Rico. In Puerto Rico, people are not confused about who owns their property. It's only FEMA who can't figure it out. In the long term, the Housing Victims of Major Disasters Act would allow for disaster relief funding under the Stafford Act to be used for land surveys land titles, and any other tax or fees associated with the transfer of property. Given the situation and circumstance that many Puerto Ricans have not obtained uh, legal titles, this has made them ineligible for post-disaster housing aid, as Adi has described, and they're cut off from programs that finance rebuilding or major repairs. And that photo of all of the blue tarps gives you a, a sense of the scope of this problem. 
keep in mind that this bill has the potential to benefit all victims of natural disasters, not not limited to those in Puerto Rico, um, people who may have trouble putting their hands on documents that will be acceptable to FEMA before they'll provide assistance to them. As we're seeing daily with the wildfires, people are lucky to flee with their lives and the clothes on their back. Um, this bill has been endorsed by Hispanic Federation, Oxfam, National Low Income Housing Coalition, and, and many others. Um, so uh, that is one thing that Congress can be moving forward on right now to help um, to help people in, in Puerto Rico and, and others that FEMA is finding it difficult to help. Um, the other issue I want to touch on just briefly is that of transparency. And these may seem unrelated initially, but they really aren't. There's a critical need to improve data transparency by the government agencies of Puerto Rico, FEMA, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban, De Urban Development. Um, in particular, we want to encourage Congress to set stricter requirements for data sharing by local and government and federal agencies, ensure that all data is made publicly available in a matter allowing for meaningful analysis, while protecting privacy interests, obviously, but also broaden the scope of data collection to ensure the needs of protected classes are met. The federal government and the Puerto Rican people and the, the general public has a direct at interest in ensuring that any individual agency does not have discretion or ability to withhold or limit data sharing among federal or local agencies or with the public. So we want to see authorizing legislation require federal agencies to share all data collected or analyzed with the public, including data on damage caused by a disaster and how federal dollars are spent. And this would have several benefits. Access to the full scope of data on unmet needs connected and collected and analyzed by FEMA and HUD and data on how resources are spent are really necessary to inform effective public participation in the development of state action plans. Public access to this data will help ensure that the use of public funds is equitably, equitably balanced among homeowners, renters, and people experiencing homelessness, and to make sure that housing infrastructure and mitigation projects are targeted to the most affected areas and the lowest income households. Making data public can help identify gaps in services as well as reforms needed for future disasters. There was a GAO report in 2010 um, that recommends that, uh, uh, that raised concern um, about um, Congress not providing uh, adequate direction in how states allocate CDBGDR funds. And the report found that after past disasters, CDBGDR funds were diverted away from housing to pay for infrastructure projects, and states have di diverted resources away from people with the greatest needs, including low-income renters and people experiencing homelessness, to relatively higher-income homeowners. Um, there is legislation right now that uh, we hope um, will try and address some of these things. Um, so, uh, you know, the bottom line is housing recovery should explicitly be made a priority for all disaster recovery action plans. And it would also decrease the number of FOIA requests that federal agencies are asked to comply with, which have overwhelmed staff. So these may seem like disconnected issues, but they're not. Lack of data transparency is a huge impediment to reaching people already denied by FEMA because of title issues to notify them that they're eligible to appeal their denial. FEMA's taking no responsibility for doing this, and advocates are unable to do this outreach because of the lack of data transparency. Thank it you, Laura. Difficult. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, just We're going to turn just over one last thing. E just one last thing. Even if legislation is not passed, we hope to see Congress holding oversight hearings to require FEMA to justify why it is not finding ways to make it easier for people to access assistance as opposed to making it harder. Absolutely. Great point there. I'll turn it over to our last speaker, Mary McFadden from Enterprise Community Partners. And then we'll open it up for questions at the end. Good morning, everyone. I'll try to be quick. Thank you so much for your attention and interest in long-term policy solutions. I've been doing disaster recovery work for more than 15 years now, and I'm really heartened by the bipartisan interest in the topic. As Laura alluded, Laura alluded Representative Wagner sponsored a bill this Congress, H.R. 45. 57, which passed out of House Financial Services, 
And that bill would permanently authorize HUD's Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Program, also called CDBGDR. And we understand that the Senate is considering a related draft uh -huh. bill. This is great news because permanent authorization is key to improving the federal government's role in disaster recovery. And I think that the most urgently needed improvement is shortening the time it takes federal funds to reach the people depending on them most to get back on their feet. There is a gap between when uh, FEMA funds run out and HUD funds arrived, arrive, which could be addressed. It's many months after Congress passes an emergency supplemental before states and local governments can even begin to draft their long-term recovery, recovery plans for HUD's review. In practice, it takes a year or more before the money begins to be spent on rebuilding and work on homes begins. Most of that delay in Washington is completely unnecessary and absolutely can be fixed. So I'd like to offer a few recommendations that would allow the funds to flow more quickly and better effectuate the congressional intent to serve disaster survivors. First, Congress should direct HUD to do formal rulemaking and issue permanent regulations rather than starting from scratch after each supplemental to write the rules. In a permanent CDBG DR program, Congress should authorize and fund more full-time employees in HUD's Disaster Recovery Division so that HUD's administration of the funds can be more efficient and they can provide better oversight. It kind of shocks the conscience that currently there are fewer than a dozen permanent HUD staff managing an open portfolio of tens of billions of dollars. They are dedicated public servants, but they're simply stretched too thin and can't move at the speed needed after catastrophic disasters like Hurricanes Harvey and Irma and Maria and Florence and Michael, plus the worst inland flooding and wildfires and tornadoes. HUD simply needs more capacity. HUD should also direct HUD to create pre-approved residential rebuilding programs that grantees can take off the shelf and implement, thus saving time and reducing the administrative burden in the period before rebuilding begins and allowing a transfer of families from FEMA to HUD in a seamless fashion. Congress and HUD should also make sure that good money is not thrown after bad and direct grantees to incorporate mitigation into any rebuilding programs. The National Institute of Building Science study funded by FEMA found that every dollar invested in mitigation saves $6 in future disaster costs. We see too much of the money going to the same communities over and over again, and smarter rebuilding can save a lot of those costs. A permanent authorization bill should prioritize low and moderate income communities to ensure that assistance gets to the communities that need help the most. The current guidelines require the grantees to direct 70% of their CDBG DR funds to low and moderate income communities. And it's only right that the priority for rebuilding dollars be meeting the needs of those least able to recover on their own. I absolutely second Laura's data sharing recommendation and would recommend that it explicitly apply to HUD as well so that they're sharing the data they have about community needs and the public is then able to analyze that data and make recommendations to inform better policy choices for meeting remaining needs. Permanent authorization should strengthen the public's ability to weigh in on local recovery plans. The public should have 30 days to review proposed plans and multiple opportunities over the course of recovery to give feedback on programs as they roll out and as changes are made over time. I'd really be very happy to talk with anyone who's interested. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Marianne. We really appreciate that. I'm going to uh, turn it over now to see if we have any questions that have come on the line. Any of our uh, participants can ask questions by using the uh, the question feature on the webinar. Lisa, yes. do you have any questions? Yes, we do have a few questions. Um, the first one is actually for Marion. Marion, you had um, mentioned a bill number, HR 45. The attendees just wanted to get clarification on what bill number you had mentioned. HR 4557. Okay. Um, the next one is also for you, Marianne. It's about um, who are the bipartisan senators expected to champion the sister bill to the Wagner bill? I'd be very happy to talk with anyone offline. Okay. Um, the next question is for the group. Um, if anyone can answer about how many hospitals in Puerto Rico are fully operational, or I guess Adi, 
<laughs> Hi. Yes. Uh, the hospitals now are fully operational, but it did take some time for it to get there. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, of the information I have now, they are now fully operational. Uh, some of them uh, in some of the most affected areas in terms of electricity are uh, still running on electric plants, but uh, they are operational. Okay. Um, the next question is about the California wildfires. If anyone can chime in about how many HUD employees are dedicated to the California wildfires. Uh, this is Eileen Jacobs. I do not know the answer to how many HUD employees, but I can say that there are not a sufficient number of HUD or FEMA employees dedicated to last year's California wildfires, and FEMA is only just beginning its response to the current wildfires, people by making referrals to Airbnbs, which doesn't seem to be an adequate response to the immediate need, but there certainly are additional staff needed, and there are very few staff in, who have been in communication with me even about last year's wildfires from HUD. Okay. Um, the next question is about DHAP. Um, the attendees would like to know what's the difference between DHAP and the currently available FEMA rental assistance. Is DHAP targeted on people who are eligible for FEMA rental assistance? Great. Yeah, there's there are major differences between the DHAP program and the other rental assistance programs that are available through FEMA. And largely, uh, the DHAP program is designed with the unique needs of the lowest income people in mind. And so you see that play out in differences in terms of the length of, of assistance that's provided. Um, FEMA's rental assistance program is provided largely uh, two, for two months. Um, they cut a check and provide it to the survivor. If the survivor knows to ask for assistance in finding housing, they can do so. Otherwise, they're on their own. That's not the case with DHAP. Mm -hmm. They're automatically paired with a local housing provider or a local housing um, professional who can help them identify permanent housing solutions. Um, the other difference uh, between it is the, the rent setting uh, in those programs. FEMA's assistance is based on the rent in the area that is hit by the disaster, not where the disaster survivor is located. So we saw that play out uh, with, especially with people who were um, displaced from Puerto Rico, who might have been displaced to places like New York City or Connecticut or other high cost areas uh, where the rental assistance that was provided by FEMA just wasn't enough to cover um, the, the what they needed. Um, uh, and we also saw it run out a lot sooner. So, so people who have the lowest incomes, who are the most vulnerable, need longer term assistance than just two months. Uh, and so they're, they're designed in very different ways. Um, so the next question is um, about the election results. Um, how do election results change? Uh, what, what's possible in this Congress? I'll, I'll step in here and then see if other folks on the line have responses to that, too. I, I think the biggest opportunity is uh, the ability for the House to start holding hearings on oversight of the disaster recovery efforts of the past year and, and currently. Uh, it's very difficult to see um, a Republican-controlled Congress um, holding the Republican administration to account. That's always difficult when there's not divided government, uh, regardless of who's in charge. Um, so I think that provides a, a unique opportunity that we're going to be encouraging House chairmen to, to take up and start looking at. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? Yeah, this is Laura. Uh, the other thing is I think we now have a Congress willing to push back more on the president and on his statements uh, like Puerto Rico shouldn't get any more money. So, uh, you know, post-election, there are going to be people willing to um, – uh, you know, to push back on him and to try to make sure or at least highlight how many of his proclamations and decisions about who should and shouldn't get assistance are politically motivated or just simply misinformed. Um, the next question is about the FEMA trailers. Uh, what was the reason for the delay of FEMA trailers arriving after Hurricane Michael? 
I'm happy to start with what I know, and then uh, maybe others can chime in too. I think a major piece of the delay is that before FEMA feels comfortable providing resources, they require the state governor, governor to make a formal request and not only to make a request for temporary housing assistance, but the specific forms of housing assistance that are needed. And clearly waiting, um, it took at least uh, three weeks or so just for that request to be approved by FEMA. In large part, we think that request was um, more speedily, more quickly uh, approved because of the attention uh, put on FEMA by a New York Times article and other, other media press that had been covering the issue. Um, but if it takes that long just for FEMA to sign the paperwork so they can start um, ordering trailers, um, you can see how there would be a likely delay. And that really needs to be sped up so that people aren't living in um, uninhabitable conditions, living in their hallways, uh, you know, sleeping in cars because they have no other options available. Um, is there anybody from um, Florida that wanted to add on to, Leslie? Um, I, you nailed it. I, that's my understanding of how the process went, that there may have been both delays in their request and then delays in the approval. I know they had explored some alternative options. Uh, that actually, the first uh, response that we originally received was that there were no trailers or mobile homes available to send, that they simply didn't have any stock to pull from to provide them. That was really... Um, disheartening because people were looking for resources. So there were discussions of cruise ships and all these other alternatives that frankly just didn't seem appealing to people and had a hard time contemplating how that was a, a, was a, a, a longer term solution to the lack of housing. Um, so, uh, but, but you nailed it. I think that's, that's exactly what the issue was. This is Eileen yeah, Jacobs. Can I, just, okay. can Sorry, I add ahead, something Eileen. on, may I add something on the trailers? Yes, the, the, the slowness in providing trailers and initial refusal in providing trailers is a long-standing historical problem with FEMA response to disasters. It has been going on, in my experience, for at least 20 years. There was a 1997 flood in Northern California in which FEMA had the same response to the farm worker community that was entirely destroyed by saying we don't have trailers and refusing to provide them and never did. And then typically there is a very long delay in providing trailers and they are not prioritized for low income people and other special populations who need them the most. Thanks, Eileen. And I just wanted to jump in to say, again, another systemic issue here is that um, we've seen, especially under this administration, um, um, a reliance on what local um, government officials say they need after a disaster. And a lot of times these local officials are trying their very best to bring resources to their communities, but they just don't have the experience and in, in, uh, institutional knowledge about what's possible, about what tools are available to them. And so uh, FEMA needs to do a better job of, of reaching out sooner and thinking more in advance about the types of solutions that are needed locally and to um, make sure that they get to communities faster. So just to be um, cognizant of the time, it is currently 11.05 a.m. Eastern time. We're just gonna do one last question. Um, and that last question is just again, Sarah, and anyone on the panel, if you could just reiterate any um, uh, case studies or best practices examples that people can do to ensure uh, uh, the equitable distribution of FEMA resources and, and CVBGR resources, who is doing it right? What can people do to make sure that FEMA comes to the table and discuss their lack of action? Um, I'll just start it off and we'll turn it over again to other speakers too. Um, I don't think there are a ton of great examples of how, of how dollars have been allocated equitably, which is the reason why the Disaster Housing Recovery Coalition came together in the first place. Um, but there are a lot of things that FEMA and HUD can be doing to make sure that their resources are reaching the people who need it the most and in an equitable way. And that starts with uh, data transparency so that we have a greater sense of what the needs are and that we can ensure that dollars are being spent accordingly with that. 
the legislation that Laura had spoken about and that uh, Marion had spoken about, Mrs. Wagner's bill, um, that would provide very clear direction to HUD that it needs to allocate its CDBGDR resources according to the needs, according to what the data says the needs are in an equitable way. Um, but there are also steps that FEMA can be doing. Um, but at the root of it, it's about uh, data transparency and transparency about where dollars are being spent. So thank you, everyone, for your questions and your time. Uh, this concludes the webinar. Um, we will circulate a link to the recording and the presentation, as well as some responses to some of the questions uh, via email tomorrow. If you have any additional questions, uh, please feel free to email the communications at NLIHC.org email address. Thank you again for your time. Have a pleasant day. Thank you. Thank you.